that come from a, a higher elevation where it's cooler do down low. So it's just using a drop in elevation to warm things up essentially. Does that make sense? If you go down, you get warmer. So if you transplant something down several hundred meters, it's in warmer conditions. Sorry? No, go ahead. Okay, so the previous one's just using a heat lamp to heat things up. I, maybe you can't see it very well here, but so here they've got a, a container and you put soil in it and you put a heat lamp above it. And then in the next one, you're building a different, slightly different kind of a soil container and then you're just moving it down slope and either planting the things at a lower elevation or, or moving whole plants down slope. <coughs> Sorry? For acclimatization? Uh, no, this is to simulate warming. So you, you want to ask yourself, well, how might these, sorry, so that's a good question. So you, you're asking yourself, how might these plants uh, respond in a warmer climate? And so one way to simulate warmer conditions is to move them down slope. Now, it's not perfect because precipitation patterns are going to change down slope as well. But you'll definitely warm things up by moving plants down slope. Um, why do we build a box and move soils if we're doing a transplantation experiment? Because the soils may be different at your lower elevation site and you want, don't want soils to be a complicating factor in this. So what sorts of things do you think that we might see as we grow plants in warmer conditions? What happens uh, if, as things get warmer um, in general? Do we expect plants to grow better or worse as it gets warmer? Sorry, Emily? Faster. Better. Faster. Yeah, faster, yep. So things, to, chemical reactions go faster as temperatures warm. Uh, photosynthesis is a chemical reaction, so we expect photosynthesis to, to occur more rapidly, and that creates more plant material, and plants can, can grow faster. And so that's, that's what we'd expect to see from theory in these experiments. Did you still have a question still? Or? Uh, what are the components of the soil? Uh, of the soils? The components of the soil. Um, in this... Or sand or what? Uh, sorry? Thermocolite or sand. Uh, so what you're trying to do in this case is just move the soils that the plants currently occur in down slope. So it could be sandy soil or it could be loamy soil. Doesn't it, whatever soil type they're in, you just want to maintain that as you do a, a down slope um, translocation. So yeah, the, the details of, of these experiments are less important than the overall message that you can have experiments that go from very simple single species experiments that are tightly controlled to more natural experiments where you have multiple plants or multiple species. Uh, and the same is true for um, CO2 experiments. So we know that plants respire, uh, uh, photosynthesize with CO2 and respire. And so what do we expect to have happen as CO2 increases in the atmosphere from human fossil fuel building? If there's more CO2 around, what are, what's likely to happen to plants? Are, are they, Ben? Are they going to be happier or sadder? So there'll be more of what they do photosynthesis around with, right? So we're burning fossil fuel, we're, we're releasing CO2 in the atmosphere, we're increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so will plants benefit from that or be damaged by that? Depends on which type they uh, they will, C3 and C4 plants will respond a little bit differently, but um, in general we expect plants to do better with more CO2 around. So it's called the CO2 fertilization effect. As we get more CO2 in the atmosphere, plants can photosynthesize more easily. Results in changes in competition because some types of plants have their stomata open or closed uh, we don't want to go there. <laughs> it, can, it can affect plants' water use efficiency as well, uh, and I'm happy to explain that to anybody later. But we, yeah? Are there, are there any thresholds of how much carbon dioxide uh, a plant needs for photosynthesis? 
in terms of in in terms of plant responses. Well, we'll look at what some of the plant responses are. So let's just finish. We're just doing sort of a tour of experimental apparatus here. So let's finish that tour um, to look at CO2. People have built these giant open cylinders, open again because they want they don't want to affect the, the rainfall reaching the plants and then they have gas infusers that just increase the concentration of CO2 within that cylinder which simulates what things might be like 50 years from now when we've put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and then even more ambitious efforts uh, ooh, well this is a little bad to see but there let's let's look at the next one instead an even more ambitious program is to put a whole ring of gas diffusers diffusers in a natural forest and people do this in forests and crops and so what this does is simply diffuse co2 out into the environment so that these plants experience a higher co2 environment and then they're measuring what happens to plant growth as a result there's a central tower which measures co2 concentration and is used to to regulate how much CO2 is, is emitted by each, each one of these little towers around the edge. And so you're just increasing CO2 in basically a natural forest or a natural grassland or in a cropland. And they've done these experiments. These are called free air CO2 enrichment experiments or FACE, F-A-C-E. And they've done them in all sorts of settings. Here's one in a grassland, uh, for instance. Okay. So, um, the very short story on experimental results is that we expect plants to grow better because in warmer environments as things get warmer and we expect them to do better or grow faster with more CO2 in the atmosphere. And that, in fact, is exactly what we observe in these experiments. So the, the first three or four experiments we saw were ways to warm things up and see how plants grow. The last few, including the face rings, are ways to see how plants respond to increased CO2. So we expect plants to grow faster in both of those cases. And in fact, they do. So this is just indicating uh, experimental results in herbaceous vegetation and woody vegetation. One is the current growth rate and then these are enhancements of, uh, I think this is just for warming, uh, above the current growth rate. So in experimental, tightly controlled experimental conditions, you get almost one and a half times as much plant growth as you do under current conditions. But something interesting happens as you get to more and more natural settings. Uh, okay, we're not going to do this one. We're going to do this one. So as you get from those tightly controlled single plant laboratory settings to the more natural multi-species multi-plant settings, an interesting thing happens. This enhanced growth from temperature and CO2 tends to disappear. So for whatever reason, there's what's called down regulation, which is when plants get into a fully natural environment, they don't experience as much growth benefit from either temperature or CO2 as they do in uh, single plant trials. So, and, and the other aspect of that is that the longer and longer you do a trial, the less and less temperature and CO2 enhancement you see. So this is actually a plot of how much CO2 enhancement, how much increase in biomass you get for, from a combination of warming and CO2 enhancement compared to how long you maintain that CO2 enhancement. So this is years here, right? So those laboratory experiments usually last a year or so. They're all clustered here and show a lot of increase in plant growth due to CO2 enrichment. But as you go out 5, 10, 15 years, very rapidly that enhanced biomass effect mostly disappears and if you get out as long as 30 or 35 years, you see that there's a very small difference between uh, current conditions and enhanced CO2 <laughs> conditions. So as you get in more and more natural settings, you see less effect and you see uh, less effect as you have longer and longer trials. So for both of those reasons, 
Uh, it's very controversial exactly what the CO2 effect in particular will be under global warming because there seems to be this situation when you're in long-term natural situations, you don't see nearly as much enhanced uh, growth as you'd expect. But the, the laboratory uh, experiments suggest you'd see a lot of enhanced growth and so people are still debating whether the laboratory experiments are right and for some reason these more natural experiments are wrong because even though they're more natural you know they're not fully natural experiments over large areas they're necessarily not you know not much larger than a face ring that you know big experiment that we saw so um, that's a brief look at what people have found from looking at enhanced temperature and CO2 experiments. Um, here's a great, a great study that was done in Town's lab that we won't talk about. Um, and now I'd like to go back <laughs> to um, species distribution models for a minute. And we looked at examples of species distribution models in the Cape. Um, but one of the big questions about future climate change is will it result in extinctions of large numbers of species? We've seen in the past that sometimes climate change did result in large numbers of extinctions. If you remember that first 500 million year ago extinction event, that was linked with climate change. So climate change has caused really large extinction events in the past. Uh, we've seen less extinction in the ice ages than we might have expected given that we're going in and out of glacial conditions over a couple of million years. We might have thought that that would drive, drive a lot of extinctions, uh, but it didn't seem to. And so people decided to use modeling, and Town and I were both involved in this study, use species distribution modeling to ask whether we might see large numbers of extinctions in the future due to climate change. 